trying to say. In order for us to compellingly tackle um, the dense subject matter of today, be it the Lebanese revolution or Intifada or Saura or however you may be comfortable to call it, um, and it's very present and future, we must, in my opinion, which is, you know, I think why, why we are here, we must first understand some fundamental truths about revolutions as proven by empirical findings, why they happen and how do they succeed. The first thing they always say is when you wanna debate anything or when you wanna explore anything, you need to define it. That's like the, the, the first thing they taught us back in school, right? Like if you're going to explore any type of topic, if you're gonna answer any type of question, be it in finance or economics or, 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 or policy or, or, or philosophy or anything, define the subject matter. What is a revolution? As agreed upon, it's a process that intends to win power by a forcible overthrow of a government or a rulership in the name of social justice in order to create new political institutions, restructure a country's polity, economy, society, and external relationships. And when they do occur, they usually come as a complete shock to everyone, including the rulers and the revolutionaries themselves, as well as foreign powers. There is a, an American sociologist and political scientist. Her name is Teda uh, Scotchbull. She's currently the, um, a professor of government and sociology at Harvard University. And she has done extensive revolutionary work that's that's basically the that's basically her um, her life her life achievement basically is she did a lot of work on revolutions <clears throat> and she said there are two myths that have long colored popular views about revolutions myth number one is that local events in third world countries are easily manipulated by imperialist gray powers with the help of like professional local re revolutions revolutionaries. So what I'm trying to say is that the, the first myth is that it's easy to manipulate revolutions in third world. That's a myth. First of all, all governments and all powers that are challenged by their people are going to resist whatever message the people are trying to say. Every single power whose legitimacy is challenged will accuse the protesters of being infiltrators, of being moles, of being spies, and they will accuse them of serving a foreign conspiracy, which is the habitual answer of all governments whose legitimacy is questioned by the population. The reason why that's a problem, because that's precisely the drama in the situation. And what is the drama? Is that that's how peaceful revolutions reach violence. Because by playing the rotting game, like all the contestant governments do, by accusing your people of conspiring against you and, and having allegiance to external forces, the powers end up legitimizing the use of force against people. And that's how they start to suppress and repress all types of demonstrations in the name of supposed country stability. So that's, um, that's a danger that follows the myth that revolutionaries can actually be hijacked by foreign powers. That's myth number one. And if you take a look at every single revolution that's happened in the 20th and the 21st century, there is almost a day-to-day -day account of what, at what point does the government come in and say conspiracy theory and starts brutalizing the protesters due to that. That happened with us, right? That's exactly what the government here did. But also, if you look next door, Syria, Libya, um, Egypt, all of these newly, newly, you know, evolved sort of revolts. Anytime you look at before, when the, when the USSR countries in Latin America, all of them, in, in of course, in, in, in the Far East, 
every time a population tried to revolt, the rulers came down and said, conspiracy, you've been hijacked by a foreign power. That's myth number one. Myth number two, which is the most important of, um, of this discussion in terms of the myths. The myth is that misery causes revolutions. It is probably the most common misperception about revolutions that they're acts of frustration and that poverty and misery and destitution um, are sufficient to foment revolutions. Shockingly, that's not just false, but it's the exact opposite. Poverty is not only generally not associated with revolution, but poverty makes people, poverty forces people to accept status quo. The large majority of famines did not lead to revolution. Modernization, contrary to what a lot of people said when the Arab Spring started, is that, oh, you know, people were going on Google Earth and looking at the different villas of the rich people, and they got so upset that they went and revolted against them. Nope. Moder moder modernization and wealth disparity does not start revolutions. The spread of new ideologies does not start revolutions. People having had enough of injustice and extreme inequality and all of that, we've heard that so many times on the different political talk shows and the different interviews that me the media conducts with revolutionaries on the, on the ground. Uh, right? We've had enough of injustice and extreme inequality. That does not start a revolution. Um, Majid Rumi sings words from Nizar Abeni's enchanting, passionate love letter to Beirut. And she says, While it is poetically beautiful, it's scientifically and empirically false. Not one revolution was born from the womb of sadness. Nizar Abani, by the way, is a lyrical genius, and that sentence is a part of a huge poem. And that's, that sentence is the least interesting part of his poem, by the way. He, I, would, I highly recommend that you go and read it. So except for that part, which is factually, empirically incorrect, everything else is quite magical. So um, as I said, shockingly, poverty does the opposite. Poverty forces people into adaptable conformity. In fact, great inequality and severe poverty are routinely justified by both religion and tradition as natural and inevitable and of pertaining to your fault. And accepting it has always been not just the normal order of things, but almost the divine order of things. If you abide by the divine code, you don't revolt, right? If you take a look at all the revolutions that occurred, they all occurred, or at least much more often than not in middle income countries than in the poorest nations. Poor nations don't revolt. Cuba was the most developed Latin American country when, when Castro seized power. And it had a massive revolution in 1959. And 10 countries in Latin America followed suit, but the poorest Latin American countries did not revolt. Haiti did not revolt, nor did the Dominican Republic. Haiti revolted in the 18th century, but it didn't revolt in the 20th century. Nicaragua revolted, Honduras, no. China and Vietnam had revolutions, India and Indonesia, no. So there is, there is a compelling reason for this. And I wish, I wish you could guess, I wish you could take some time to guess what causes some nations to revolt and others not. There is one cross-present factor that catalyzes disagreement into revolution in almost every single revolution. 
as I said, it's not poverty, it's not wealth disparity, it's not oppression, it's not anything that has to do with the economy. What is it? Can you guess? Can you write it in, um, if somebody can, um, somebody said education. Have, uh, education, consciousness, social bond. Social bond, consciousness of the idea of living the injustice, not living the sadness, okay. Um, middle class, interesting. Freedom. Interesting. Freedom, upper class, very close, but it's not a class issue, but it's very close. Um, wow. Okay. I'm, 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 I'm happy you, I'm happy you all answered. Yep. So here it is. Um, the, the cross present factor, as I said, that is the, the main catalyst of turning disagreement into revolution are the elite. Not any elite, the alienated elite who decided that they've been systematically and unjustly excluded from favor and they turn against the regime. Dare I say it's maybe the people sitting in this room, in this Zoom room today, some of them are, you know, it's a small group of people who have wealth, education, social privilege, and political power who will foment every revolution. They provoke the revolution. Fidel Castro, I'd like to remind everybody, um, Fidel Castro was a lawyer. Che Guevara was a medical doctor. The founders of the Sandinistas were all wealthy university graduates. Um, elites foment revolutions. And history has shown that if it is the elites that will mobilize the population and utilize the big titles of poverty and, and wealth discrepancy in order to mobilize the population to overthrow the regime but it comes from the elite. And when I say elite, don't confuse it with nobility, noblesse, right? Like the very archaic way of seeing, it's not a class, it's not a class thing. Elites are those who have access to, to shots, right? Education, wealth, social privilege, political power, those four things. Have you ever drunk from a glass of wine large enough to hold a goldfish? You're probably the elite, you know? So, um, and, and, um, and visionary leaders with the help of the elites will draw on the power of the masses to eventually forcibly bring into existence a new political order, okay? I'll delve into some examples of elites because I find it, I find it fascinating. It is, it is really a topic that of passion and fascination for this person here. There was a revolutionary passion in the 18th century, deeply influenced by the, the age of enlightenment ideas, ideals of liberty and equality. Okay, that all came out in the 18th century. And it resulted in massive, unprecedented sort of like upheaval across the world. It started with the American Revolution in 1776 and the French Revolution of 1789, and it inspired many. Who is getting inspired? The elites. So who started the, who started the French Revolution? Take that example, okay? Take that example. Um, there were 10 very important leaders of the French Revolution, okay, 10. There was an abbot who was a very famous political discourse writer by the name of Emmanuel Joseph Sies. He played an important part in propelling France towards revolution. Then you had a count and a marquis, un comte et un marquis, 
the, le Comte de Mirabeau and the Marquis de Lafayette. These two are the most famous leaders of the early stage of the Re French Revolution. Then as the revolution gathered steam, the political class of France was divided between the, the more moderate Girondin and the more radical Montagnard. Well, the leader, the most important leader of the Girondin is called Jacques-Pierre Brissot. He was a lawyer and he was a political writer. And the most important leader of the, um, of the, um, of the Montagnard is Maximilien Robespierre, who is, his reputation precedes him, but he is a very, very notable lawyer and a statesman. Externally, a mathematician and a physician uh, by the name of uh, Lazare Carnot and an army general, Napoleon Bonaparte, were the leading figures that helped France win the Revolutionary Wars. So the French Revolution was literally fomented, exercised, planned, and taken to fruition by the elites. And it was the day that the elites decided to turn their backs on the monarchy that the monarchy stopped seeing the light of day. That's the French Revolution. The American Revolution, also known as the United States War of Independence or the American Revolutionary War, which happened in, between the uh, years of 1775 and 1783, not to be confused with the American Civil War, which took place a whole century later. But this revolution, this American Revolution caused 13 of supposedly of Great Britain's North American colonies to win their political independence against the British crown. And they went on to form the United States of America. Well, who started the American Revolution? The elites. We know their names by heart because the US makes us, like the US reminds us of their names at every turn, who they are, if not through political speeches, then in movies. It's not in movies and Broadway shows and it's not in Broadway shows on the, on the actual currency. The faces of these elite revolutionaries are on the currency, the US currency. George Washington was a Virginian plantation owner. Don't get, doesn't get more elite than that. He's the founding father, he's one of the founding fathers of the United States, and he's the one who led the Continental Army to victory in the Revolutionary War. He was America's first president. He's the guy on the $1 bill. Benjamin Franklin, a very respected inventor, publisher, scientist, diplomat. He helped draft the Declaration of Independence and the US Constitution, and he negotiated the the Treaty of Paris in 1783, and he, en he ended the Revolutionary War. He's the guy on the $100 bill. Um, Patrick Henry was an attorney and, and, and a, a major, major figure of the American Revolution. For sure, you, you, you might have heard the sentence that he's most famous for. You might not know it's attributed to him, but give me liberty or give me death. That's Patrick Henry who said it. Then there's, of course, Alexander Hamilton, not just a founding father and a constitutional uh, constitutional convention delegate, but he's the author of the Federalist Papers, the first secretary of the US Treasury, and he's the star of the $1 billion franchise Hamilton Broadway musical right now. Guy on the $10 bill, still ongoing, you know? Uh, I mean, I don't want to drag too long with all the founding fathers, but there's also, of course, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, by the way, Thomas Jefferson was born into one of the most prominent families of Virginia's planter elite. His own mother, called Jane Randolph, is a direct descendant of royalty. And this elite is the primary draftsman of the US Declaration of Independence. He's the third president of the United States. He stabilized the US economy. He was responsible for doubling the size of the United States by successfully brokering the Louisiana Purchase. He's on the $2 bill, by the way, which is a very rare bill. But um, all these American revolutionaries who fomented the revolution are the elite, exactly like in France and exactly like in Latin America later and exactly in practically every single revolution that you can possibly think of. Elites, elites, that's what kickstarts a revolution. If the elites remain allied to the government, if the elite is pleased and focused, regimes stay stable for centuries. If a significant portion of the elite decides to form a coalition 
with diverse popular groups against the ruler or the rulers demanding major change, a revolution has unquestionably begun. Only elites can turn poverty and inequality into a motivation for revolution. So that's, that's, that's what we establish with how a revolution begins. Not poverty, not famine, not torture, not... I've, I've heard the very fallacious um, um, theory that tomorrow when the Lebanese pound is gonna reach to, I don't know, 20,000 to the dollar or 30,000 to the dollar, everyone is gonna take to the streets. Nope, the opposite is gonna happen. It is in the benefit of the people in power to actually cause poverty because that will not at all mobilize people unless the elites do a very, very, um, thought out strategy to use that point to mobilize, great, but it doesn't stop there. And this is the next point that I wanna make. What guarantees a successful revolution? Yeah, we can start a revolution, but what guarantees? If, if you take a look at Latin America, okay? We talked about the US, we talked about France and their revolutions. If you take a look at Latin America, half of the continent revolted within the span of 30 years. Argentina, Cuba, Bolivia, Guatemala, Peru, Uruguay, Venezuela, um, all, had, um, all had revolutions. And it's really helpful to, that's, that's, that's really the amazingness of having history be um, readable to us. It's no longer like it used to be before that you had to physically go somewhere to be able to get your hands on a pamphlet or a document so that you can educate yourself about something happening halfway across the world, but hundred years ago. There are 11 revolutions that happened in Latin America between 1959, uh, 1953 and 1983. 11 revolutions in 11 countries, they have so much in common. They all were, they all had a type of dictatorship that was ruling them. They all had that type of oppression that goes hand in hand with dictatorship, right? And when those revolution occurred, they had all of these points in common. All, every single one of these Latin American uh, revolutions had leadership and that came from the urban youth, which is what we're talking about today, right? The new generation, urban youth leaders. They had a set ideology, which is something that the Lebanese revolution doesn't have at the moment, but they had a set ideology. They weren't just going against the regime. They wanted to establish an ideology which was a mixture of Marxism and nationalism, all of them. They all had the same revolutionary strategies, which is called the FOCO strategy, which was advocated by Che Guevara, which is to have a small and dedicated band of mobile, mobile revolutionaries use strategic armed violence, mostly aimed at police, posts and army units to simultaneously weaken the government and then recruit more masses to their side. They all supplied long organizational preparation with a very precise set of objectives and they all emerged at the same time within a span of a couple of decades, right? Castro's first revolutionary act, 1953, 1983, the last one is El Salvador. They're similar revolutionary movements they operate in similar locales. They have very similar cultural ramifications, but only two succeeded. Why? Over the past 120 years, other than those two Latin American um, success, revolutionary success stories, there have also been a handful of successful revolutionary movements 
and but countless unsuccessful revolutionary movements. And when you contrast the similar revolutionary movements operating in similar locales, like I just said about Latin America, social scientists were actually able to isolate three criteria for success. And it turns out that there is no readily apparent socioeconomic characteristic that distinguishes countries with successful revolutions from those who failed. Basically what I'm saying, it's not GNP per capita. It's not percentage of labor force that's like um, in agriculture, meaning how much are, are educated and modernized, how much are not. It's not the degree of urbanization. It has nothing to do with adult literacy rates. It has nothing to do with the amount of violence used. Contrary to what many people believe, a successful revolution is a violent one, not at all. Successful revolutions can happen peacefully and can happen with violence. Violence is not actually a stake, nor is distribution of income, nor is distribution of land that determines the success or failure of a revolution. It's not an economic equation. What is it then? It's a political equation. Three criteria that are present in all successful revolutions are the following. Number one, revolutionaries construct, hear me out, this is, this is really important, wide range, range alliances and coalitions of all types of opponents across all classes. We are talking broad groups. We're not talking just individual Marquis de Lafayette types. We are talking large coalition strata that cut across mainstream politicians, members of the clergy, members of the business community, elites, much of the middle class, upper class, lower class, army, and foreign powers. A wide ranging alliance. You don't have that alliance, you're one step short from success. That's the first, that's the first, um, that's the first condition that has been posited by history for successful revolutions to, to take forth, to go forth. Number two, revolutions, revolutionaries must gain a level of international legitimacy, okay? Can somebody have their mic on? Does somebody want to say something? Don't worry, someone is unmuted, but I'm going to take care of them. Oh, okay, okay. So, so as I said, the second, the second... We have um, questions uh, when you're ready, okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. How much time do I still have till 7.30, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, no worries. Yes. Okay. Well, you want to ask them some questions? Oh, well, I mean, I'll take them later, right? Okay, so um, revolutionaries, the second, the second part, the second important part to talk about is international legitimacy. If you construct that coalition and you have the elites fomenting and you don't have, you don't gain legitimacy from outside, you will be crushed, completely crushed. What does it mean legitimacy? What does it mean international legitimacy? Many people have a, a, an unfortunate reaction when we talk about international because they believe it has to do with interference, right? They believe like, we don't want any foreign powers to interfere or we don't want any foreign powers to come through and tell us what to do. That's not what international legitimacy means. International legitimacy means the international community looks at your revolutionary movement and says, you're right, you have a valid cause, we're behind you. But we're behind you, not with, they don't send weapons, they don't send armaments, they don't necessarily send any money. It's just the legitimacy, because if you don't have that international legitimacy and the foreign powers are still talking to the rulership that we are trying to topple, good luck. It can be a degree of tangible assistance from offering refuge, to training, to diplomatic support, 
But all revolutions that have sorely lacked um, that type of international legitimacy have failed. So that's the second part. The third part, and this is going to be something that's quite tricky for our Lebanese revolution. What is the third factor that will contribute historic, that has could historically seemingly contributed to the success of revolution? Number one, we said wide range coalition between different strata of society. Number two, we said gaining international legitimacy. Number three, you must be opposed as a revolution to a narrowly based dictatorship that has lost its legitimacy. Because this creates a unity in the opposition to a fundamentally corrupt, illegitimate, increasingly repressive regime that preempts all sectors of the economy for themselves and their associates. This overrides the serious actual and potential differences between the various elements of the coalition. And here is the actual question. What, how does this translate? Does the revolution agree that killon yani killon? If the answer is no, you lose that third point. If the revolution goes, no, I mean, it, the oligarchy is just bad, but some are worse than others. So we're going to keep a few and we're just going to seek to punish a few. Forget it. I tell you from now, there's nothing called a revolution then. If it's not, meaning in a very, this concentrated corrupt power overrides all of these different oligarchs. You go against the entire oligarchy. If you go for half of it, if you don't have a type of unity amongst the revolutionaries that say, I don't agree that this guy needs to go, but this guy needs to go. And then somebody else says, no, I don't agree. That guy needs to go, but not that guy needs to go. Forget it. Forget it. You don't have unity amongst the revolution. They will eat. It will eat itself. The revolution will eat itself. And this actually brings me to a very... Listen, the adages of history are the most interesting. It's not for nothing that there is a sentence that says, revolutions end up devouring their own sons. La révolution dévore ses propres enfants. Because of that. Following this format, Nicaragua and Cuba, two of the most successful revolutions of the 21st of the 20th century went from being uh, led by small bands of urban youth to genuinely nationwide movement have gone down history as the most successful revolutions and they eradicated the regimes in place and they put new regimes how we judge those regimes that's another topic but the revolution was successful but their neighbors Peru, Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, Guatemala, Uruguay, and Venezuela all failed because they couldn't meet those three. So what I want to say, and then that could be the last thing I say, and then I can start taking um, questions, is the Lebanese revolution needs its urban youth, needs its elite, needs its, uni its unity against an oligarchy in order to move forth. And this revolution, this Lebanese revolution, which today is not a revolution yet, in, in, it's been massive revolts. It's been an intifada, but it hasn't achieved what a revolution, the revolution topples. The fact that the government resigned, that's not toppling the oligarchy. We toppled the oligarchy, that's the day that the revolution actually get, goes forth, right? Sorry, the intention of toppling the oligarchy. We can have the intention of toppling the oligarchy and fail, it'll be a failed revolution, but do we have the intention of toppling the oligarchy? If we do, and we follow through with everything that history has 
taught us. The Lebanese revolution can go down in the annals of history as one that changes the face, not just of Lebanon, but of the world forever. Because we would have done something that's almost unprecedented in our region. We already have gone further than many revolutions have. We underestimate the fiscal weakness of this old guards regime. We underestimate the magnitude of the popular support for change that this revolution has fomented in people. We underestimate the power of our true broad range countrywide type of coalition that we have achieved even without anyone working for it. It's cross-confessional, cross-national alliance that has been um, provoking continuous protests. We also underestimate the ill effects of fiscal decay. We also underestimate what Lebanon, the Lebanese oligarchy has done to alienate its elite. And we also underestimate the type of international support for our revolutionary change. We have met all of these criteria. There is only one thing we haven't met yet, and it's the third criteria, which is, do you agree that you are going to go towards the entire oligarchy, no matter what? Some revolutionary governments come to power with surprising speed. Others advance with much more lengthy struggle to like expand their base and displace their regime for over more than a decade. But seizing power is just the first phase of revolutionary process, which we haven't even had, which we don't even have um, traction for at the moment. We have what it takes. There's no traction towards that. We need to build that traction to seize the power. But when you seize power, that's the beginning of the biggest uphill battle because there are a number of critical decisions that will need to be decided on for any revolutionary government to succeed because the diverse groups who make a revolution have not ever agreed on the following questions. How will the leaders be chosen and under what laws will we rewrite a constitution? France, by the way, like really listen, listen to what, France went from being a full-blown monarchy for centuries to having a revolution and establishing its first republic. Then it went back to being a full-blown empire just 12 years later. Then it went back to restoring its monarchy for a couple of decades or more, three, three or four decades. Then it back to being a republic, then back to being a full-blown empire, then back to being a republic all within 78 years. Ta, 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 ta. And today, they are the only secular, real secular state in the world, and they're at their fifth republic, they, at their fifth type of constitution. So what is our constitution going to be? Um, will power be centralized, or will it be dispersed to regional and local authorities? What will, the, what will the new relationship with other states be? What's the relationship with Syria, with Palestine, with Israel? with Cyprus, with Saudi Arabia, with Iran? Will, will, will it seek new allies? Will there be a redistribution of property? Will there be a change within the state's relationship to religion? How will the new government finance its operations? Is it gonna be via old taxes or is it gonna raise new ones? How about seizure of property and, and, or sale of state assets? How do we feel about that? How will the remaining leaders and supporters of the old regime be treated? Will there be a pursuit in justice or not? What new rules should guide the economy? How are we going to write our education system? What about the media? Is there some such a thing as non-free press? What does free press really mean? What is a red line for the media? What about public services? What's the role of minorities? How about, how about immigrants? How do we treat immigrants? How, we, how do we treat you know, uh, giving Lebanese citizenship or giving Lebanese residents to people? What measures will be taken to address the economic crisis? 
the deficits, the fiscal crisis. So, these are questions that have to be answered by the opposition. Instead of using the word revolution, I will use the word opposition to the oligarchy. And the, and the oligarchy knows that the opposition practically doesn't exist except in people's emotional states. And that's not enough to topple a regime. They've already been, they've, they've been preparing for the next elections for a while now. They know exactly what they're gonna do. The opposition doesn't, doesn't have any idea what it's gonna do in the up upcoming elections. Those who are asking for uh, early elections, I think want to, are, are kamikazes. They want to like commit suicide, national suicide. So a coalition needs to become clear as day with very specific ways forward. And we need to start talking to the people because this is something that I need to say. The new generation is playing a huge role in this revolution, huge role. They're taking on secularism and they're taking on policy in a much more courageous way than any of their predecessors have. They have a sense of responsibility that is actually instilled in them that has not, that was not instilled in their parents' generations and their grandparents' generations. The new generation is going, is already starting to beat the drum. It's already starting to march to the beating drum of like a new nation. The problem is it's still just an, an idea in our heads, like a feeling, not even an idea. It's still a feeling in our hearts. It needs to start materializing on paper and it needs to start materializing in the streets. I have spoken to too many people who have said, yes, I support the Sauda, but no, I will not vote for the Sauda. That is alarming as hell. And the question back that I ask is why? And they say, not good enough. Like, I don't know what they stand for. I don't know who they are. I don't know. So my retort is, you'd rather vote for somebody who may not be great enough or, or good enough, but you will vote for the known corrupt clientelist thief murderer. And they don't think that way because for them, they're so done with the way everything has been running that they don't want to see anything like mediocre that they want to they don't want to associate their name with anything mediocre. So they just decide to say, I'm out of this game. I don't like anyone, I'm out of this game. And some of them are physically out of this game, like they leave. But I will end this session with the following sentence. That I urge you to take you for the rest of your lives. This is the last thing I say before I give the floor back to Renda. There is an Italian, a genius Italian aphorism, like a, 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 a proverb, that was popularized by Voltaire, okay? Voltaire quoted that aphorism in one of his articles it published in his genius work called uh, Dictionnaire Philosophique. And the aphorism goes, allow me to say it in Italian first. Il meglio e l'inimico del bene. Il meglio e l'inimico del bene. I'll translate it in one second, but I want to say that Voltaire, arguably one of the most, the smartest savant philosophers who have ever crossed path on this earth, loved this sentence so much that he not only put it in this article, but he started his very, um, very famous poem called La Begueule, um, saying this in French, Dans ses écrits, un sage italien dit que le mieux est l'ennemi du bien. What does the sentence translate to? Il meglio est l'inimico del bene. The best is the enemy of good. Or if I may, perfection is the enemy of good. Please don't look for perfection 
in making any of the groundbreaking decisions that are coming up with the opposition. Asking the opposition for perfection will kill the opposition. Al-Afdal or Al-Kamal the, the Perfection is the enemy of good. Be careful if you start asking for perfection. You would be actually committing a type of philosophical assassination to the Saura. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. This is really inspiring and uh, it made me think about a lot of things. So we have plenty of questions on the chat box. We still have 30 minutes, so stay with us, guys, because we will take all your questions. Uh, we are also live on YouTube, so you can follow I Have Learned Academy on, on YouTube and check uh, what's going on. Uh, like if you want to check, if you missed the beginning, you can, uh, you can uh, watch it again. So I also sent you an evaluation form to fill it uh, at the end of the session, as well as a link to our upcoming events. So before I take your questions, I would like just to remind you that this session is uh, part of a series of events that we've been doing uh, in partnership with Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, the German NGO. And we've done already plenty of topics, uh, uh, an amazing panel called The Leaders Among Us, how like uh, individuals took initiatives one about finance, financial inflation, one about the corruption virus. We've done uh, oil and gas, technology and governance, and why we follow leaders. So uh, we have so many topics coming for next year as well. We will have two topics per year in partnership also with uh, CAST. And you can, we have also a surprise for you, but I cannot say more. You can stay tuned on our channels to discover what it is, but it's related to something I'm sure you will love. Concerning uh, your questions, um, we have so many, so I will start by, uh, we have also some people raising uh, their hands. Uh, so we will uh, talk about, first I was wondering about when you were talking about the elites, Sarah, mm. uh, someone was asking if this is the case in Lebanon. So do you think that in Lebanon, it was the elite who started the revolution? So there is a, a very interesting thing to say. The very first day, which is literally October 17th, something else happened, right? I personally was not on the ground at that point, but something else happened. And the, there were supposedly people who went down to revolt as per a political demand by a very established political party. Um, that was supposed to just be for an evening as per the insiders of that political party. That was supposed to just be a little bit of a poke here and there. But it did create a type of it did create a type of um, um, parallel response by others who uh, eventually joined. But those who were calling join are the elites. Think of all the messages you received by people who were sharing the who were sharing the different um, like pamphlets for. Who are these people? The elites. Who are the people who did all of these accounts that follow, that follow specifically what's happening in the Thawra? Who was organizing and saying, go and do... These are called by elites. Those who execute on the, on the, on the, on the, in the streets are not the elites, but the people calling for it are the elites. They are. Okay. There are people. Uh, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, we have a question from Yorgo. He's asking, what about George Soros organizations like Optar who are trying to establish a new regime in the world? I mean, that I think that's something that I don't know how to opine on because it's not part of. Um, I don't think it's part of just scientific policy. Um, so I don't quite know how to answer that. <laughs> Um, anything that goes by anything that goes by predicting um, conspiracy type of behavior doesn't really fit at least from my, my own experience doesn't really fit with how things are run on the ground um, manipulation, external manipulation is really, really hard to achieve. 
any and like it's really hard to interfere in foreign and it's really hard to which to it's really hard to interfere successfully in revolutions which is part of the first myth that i talked about like if someone assuming that's the case like how it usually assuming that's even the case imagine someone had an idea of wanting to establish a type of secret empire it's going to be if that someone is not like an imperial even if that someone was an imperial power, the imperial power had difficulty doing that. Imagine them being just an individual with a type of organization and purported philosophies of how the world should be run. It's just gonna sell books, it's gonna get clicks on some videos, but it's not gonna do anything on the ground. So that's my opinion. Okay, we have a question from Christy. Uh, she's saying, what are your measurements for the success of a revolution? Are we talking from human rights point of view, social equality, etc.? Because not all successful revolutions were progressive. Oh, absolutely. She's Christy's completely right. And it, when I say a successful revolution, it it is by no means a judgment on what ensued after the revolution. Okay. So it, when I say successful revolution, it means they successfully toppled the regime and ousted all the old guards and instilled a new one in the name of social justice. The Islamic revolution of Iran of 1979 was made in the name of social justice, even though when you look at Iran today, there's no form of social justice. So, but that's the point of doing a revolution. You want to instill a new type of governance, new foreign relations, you rewrite the, the institution, you rewrite the constitution, and you, and you decide on what social justice means, right? A successful revolution is when you're done with the old guard regime and you put something new. Whether this something new is qualitatively superior to the old guards or not is not what's at, what is not the topic here. Many, many revolutions succeeded and brought about a very, very dark age. Um, so a revolution per se doesn't necessarily mean good. A revolution just means change, right? And not all change is good. So I just, I just, uh, I just thought this is very important for us to, um, to, to understand. So that's that's my answer. If we say in two words, what for you, what could be a success factor? How would you say that this revolution was successful? In Lebanon. Let's say in Lebanon. Uh, you topple the old guards regime, so they lose complete legitimacy in the eyes of their people, they lose the elections, you, write, you rewrite the constitution to include um, much more social justice, you run the country based on secular principles of equality, and you, you, you put forth very progressive environmental uh, policies, very progressive infrastructure policies, and very progressive education policies. That's, that would be the ultimate success, I think. Okay, thank you. Which comes to our next question. Caroline is asking, how can we get rid of the corrupted uh, people when they have massive dedicated followers? And Anwar commented that Italians and Ukrainians threw their corrupt politicians in dustbins. Like when I was watching this, by the way, I was like, wow, <laughs> that's really awesome. But how can we really get rid of them? You're on mute, uh, Sarah. Yeah, no, I'm, no, I'm here. Um, we get rid of them by... Um, by mobilizing ourselves very diligently and very precisely in the next elections. The next elections are, should be the most important battle of our lives because they will determine a lot. And for if you go, if you take to the streets today and you ask people if they, um, support the revolution. Do this exercise, by the way, not with your friends who all think like you, maybe some of us have friends who don't think like us, but don't do that exercise with, with peers. 
do it. Like next time you step into a coffee shop, ask, ask the person who might be sitting to your right, you know, without looking stocky or ask the, 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 the person who's serving your coffee or ask the taxi driver or ask the cashier at the supermarket, do you support the revolution? 80% are going to say yes. 80% are going to say yes. 80%, which by the way, is enormous. 80% are going to say, I'm done with this oligarchy. Then ask them a follow-up question. Are you going to vote for the revolution? You're going to be shocked that more than nine, more than eight out of more than 80% are going to say no. That is, I said that word before, alarming and distressful and extremely unfortunate. But that just means that the revolution is not doing its work. It's not yet, right? I'm, I would like to put yet because we need to start, we need to stop talking amongst ourselves and we need to start talking to the people who are not participating in the WhatsApp groups who are not participating in the protests, who are not participating in any of the Congresses that we are trying to throw, they're, they're, they're the voters. We need to start talking to them. That is extremely crucial to, and by the way, like you don't need to know everything about everything in order to get a vote. You need to have passion you need to have charismatic faces. I cannot insist enough on the fact that just honest, honest, uh, whatever, honest candidates, not gonna cut it. It's not gonna cut it. Honest is like the, the most basic principle of everything. It's like, I always say to those who co comment on the honesty of candidates, I'm like, you run, I mean, Renda, you run an organization. You are somebody who's gone, who's done really well in her life. Imagine if every person that you've hired in your system, every person that you've worked in your organization with is just honest, but they're not organized and they're not ambitious and they don't do their homework and they don't come on time and they don't do follow up and they don't read your emails and they don't, I mean, honest is just the most basic. It's like, it's like, oh, you know, like, Randa, do you really like your partners? And you say, yeah, I like it because they don't steal my money. It's, that's not enough, right? Like, we all know that we cannot build anything, let alone a small company, based on just the idea that I have an honest partner. Honest is like a basic, a basic principle. It's like, it's like they have to be human beings. They have to be honest. They have to be so much more. They have to be charismatic, and they have to be talkers and the talkers in a, in a, in an, in an intelligent sense, not just Hanakiani, they have to be connected. They have to seek connection with people and they have to bring those to the polls. And also this is something that is, that I genuinely believe not through grimy images of reality. People are not attracted to misery. If I say, you know, if you don't vote for me, you're going to die. Matt, like that's not the way to do it. Like if you don't vote for me, you will die and your child will die of cancer and your mother will die of cancer and everyone, no one's gonna vote for you if that's your speech. If your speech is just an anti-rhetoric of like vote for me because the other guy is horrible, not enough, not enough. Step up your game with connection. Again, you don't need to know everything. I don't want your economic policy and I don't want your fiscal policy and I don't want your environmental policy. I want you, I wanna know who you are, what you stand for. And then we can talk about your policies. People don't vote for policies, people vote for people, really. Yeah. People, it, people vote for people. In our country, we have not been conditioned to vote for people. We have been conditioned to vote as per, I mean, I don't wanna, I, I, I want to save this for maybe other questions, but we have been mostly vo voting against stuff. Like, I'm against the slash of Allah. 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 That's the main problem. <laughs> eh, no, we, nobody's voting for. Like, I want to vote for Randa because I really like Randa. But I don't vote for Randa because I don't want to be my. It's not enough. 
Randa needs to therefore present herself to me, connect herself to me so that I can see myself in Randa. And then later we can talk about Randa's fiscal policy, but believe me, that's not what I'm gonna vote for Randa on. Next, sorry, I went too, too long <laughs> yeah. on this question. We have a question from Lulu Hazen. She's asking, uh, do you agree with the decentralized approach of the current Soda? Is there a reason why it lacks leadership? Yeah. Um, so when you say decentralized approach, do you mean like no leader? Like we, yeah. we're, we're all Lacks in this together. Leadership. Okay. So this is a very good question and it's an interesting question. I will try to keep it short to, to take uh, other questions. Um, I think it was wise and fair and understandable for the Saura to have had no leaders for a while. And the reason is because several reasons. One of the first reasons is um, we have an allergy. We have come forth with an allergy to uh, any figurehead of Zaame, Zaim. So I don't want, I, I just want to express myself right now. This was the point of the Thawra. I just want to express, I want to express my strife and my anger and my, 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 my I am doneness kind of uh, criteria of my temperament because I am done with this. But nobody was coming forth and being like, I'm done with this, but I want this guy, you know? It was not, I want this guy, right? So establishing the leadership then would have been like taking, putting, stifling the mouths of people and being just like, this person is gonna represent you. And umabad di'ana, this is literally what happened to the French Revolution. The revolutionary ended up becoming emperor. Right? And he literally became the emperor and he, he crowned himself and he crowned his wife and things like that. And even though I don't think anyone was doing the analogy of Napoleon, but it's second nature for us to be just like, no, no egos, no names, no crowns. I don't want anyone to do this. So that's very understandable and it's actually recommended. The second point as to why that was a good strategy is because you are going against a type of murderous ghost. You don't know where the bullet comes from. You assume, you know, but you're not sure, you know. So getting killed, getting murdered, getting, getting um, framed, which is a type of murder, that, but it's a psychological murder, right? If I see that, I don't know, um, Renda, again, uh, we emerge her as the leader of the Thawra, uh, that she's an Israeli spy after like a week, right? Or like, I might hurt Renda physically, or I might, I might hurt someone close to Renda. That's the strategy of the... So they didn't want to take that risk either because that which was wise. And third of all, there was a moment where people needed to just take it out. They just needed to take it out, not look at faces and names, just take that out and just mobilize, mobilize, mobilize. The issue is it's a finite resource, which is where, what we're, where we're at at the moment. You can mobilize without organization, you're doomed, you're going to die. Mobilization without organization is failure. So I agree to answer just Lulu's question. I agree with the fact It's completely understandable and fair that that's how it has gone on for a while. But the time to organize and emerge a type of leadership is now, if not four months ago, extremely important. And that's, you know, that's the whole, that, that joins everything that I was saying at the end. Next question. Uh, Joe is asking, how can we push for a psychological revolution? How can we make sure that it's not a psychological operation uh, and maybe we are in the middle of a huge geopolitical change imposed on us? How can we push for a psychological revolution? I'm not sure I understand, like a cultural revolution? Or uh, if, if Joe is here, maybe... Think, he can... Some people are saying we are in a psychological war in a way and maybe uh, Joe means that how can we do, on the contrary, a psychological revolution on our... Uh, leaders, I would say. By connecting to people, people need to start seeing 
who the opposition is, that's going to ensue with a psychological type of revolution. Theoretically, people are done with the oligarchy on so many fronts and so many levels. Practically, they don't know what that means. We need to start practically incurring connections with people. We need to start putting our hands together in almost a physical way, even though there's COVID, but screw it. The nation is like hanging by a thread and we need to start uh, connecting with people because when you connect with people and they find themselves in you, you know what? The, the phrase me too, not the hashtag me too movement. I'm not talking about that, even though it's a colossally important movement, but me too is so important to build anything. You want people to say, Anna come in. Anna mitlak. I am like you, me too. Yeah, me too, right? If you establish me too, you get a psychological revolution because you start getting votes. You, the last thing you want is for people to say, not you, because that goes against the me too and it goes against the psychological revolution and it goes into like sitting out all of our powers in the next elections. I hope that was clear. Hmm. Guy is asking, what is the perfect electoral system for Lebanon? Guy is asking a really good question. Perfect doesn't exist. And don't forget that the enemy of good is perfect, as we have just talked about. But the electoral system we have at the moment is really as best as you can hope for. Let me explain, OK? We move from a majoritarian type of electoral law to a proportional law. Why and who and how they redrew it, sure, there was a lot of like arm wrestling between the different factions to see who gets the most seats in and who gets the most votes. And they redrew districts for specific politicians. Fine, okay. But in the old system, you needed, I was talking to an electoral expert, so he's the one who gave me this data, uh, which is fascinating. You needed 110,000 votes to get one candidate in in, in Liqa in the ah, in the old system. You needed 110,000 votes to get one person in. Today, you need 10,000 to get one person in. We were able to lista, like put a, put a candidate, like a, like a Mujtama like Madani candidate, no matter how controversial she may be for some people, but Paula Yaoubian won with 2,000 votes. You couldn't have dreamt about that. Jumana Haddad was going to make it with 400 votes. There's a guy who made it with something like six votes. What I'm trying to say is the opposition cannot hope for a better system at this point. Because the possibility of incurring success through new candidates is as high as it has ever been for Lebanon. So let's get to work. Uh, Lin is asking, who do you think are the elites who started the revolution in Lebanon? And I don't know. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, it's okay. Also, uh, Celine is also asking if it was a bad idea to start the Saura. You know, some people are saying, uh, <laughs> no. This is an oversimplification of a problem that was going to eat our eyes out anyway. We were going towards demise, economic demise. If you so read, a good idea for you. Not just a good idea, it's the most necessary thing. Mm -hmm. We were going towards total economic and fiscal demise. Uh, it's been predicted for years. If you read some of the economic articles that were, that were published two, three years ago, they were saying Lebanon is headed for a collapse, which is something that many, many leading economists in the world, including some of the many Lebanese economists understood, but the leadership didn't understand. They did, when I say didn't understand, I, did, I don't mean turned a deaf ear or decided not to do anything about it. Don't understand, yani, ma topic. 
يعني they don't know what it means GDP they don't know what it means um, subsidies they don't know what it means taxes they don't know what it means interest they don't know what it means uh, they don't know what any of that means they don't know that that we are we are ruled not just by corrupt clientelist murderers we are ruled by ignoramuses that are dangerously ignorant so no that's not the soda at all this is this is the regime who did that and we, we who, are the, who are the elites who started the revolution so they I mean, it's not so much in the names and the faces as much as it was about like the different organizations, right? So professors at AUB and not AUB, at professors at universities did their share, right? Army people did their share. Um, uh, lawyers, barristers did their share. Um, and then business owners did their share. So when you see And then, and then intellectuals did their share, graphic designers did their share. When I say graphic de designers, I mean the ones who head the graphic design agencies. I mean the ones who head the big marketing agencies. Yeah. They all, all interfered. And if you take a look, if you try to follow through, if you get a poster from the Saura and you try to link it back to who did it, you will find it's somebody that's very much at the high end, at the, at the top. It's not some students sitting in their dorm board on a Sunday. It's somebody, it, the, 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 the control, um, the controlling uh, queue, not controlling, the queue came from a very high up executive. And not in a like weird, you know, um, snaky kind of way. It's, it's, that's the beauty of it. It was extremely spontaneous. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ruka is asking, uh, don't you think that them, uh, between brackets, monsters, bringing up the electoral law now was just a trap to postpone the elections for another nine years? And we are currently working on the 51% who did not vote in 2018. Yeah. Uh, it is, you know, I think um, the oligarchy is not afraid of the Saura. The oligarchy is afraid of itself. Today, the oligarchy is not afraid of the Saura. They know it's not going to do much. Today, today, yani December 15th, 2020. Today, the oligarchy is not afraid of the Saura. The oligarchy is afraid of the, of the other parties in the oligarchy. So they're trying, they're trying to figure out how to match make a new deal between themselves because the, the, uh, the Saura is, what, it's an illusion for them. Right. And rightfully so for them to think that way. If we went to the elections tomorrow, they're going to win 99% of the seats. I don't even know if Pola will be reelected, by the way. Like, I don't know. <laughs> like, it. What do you think of, of the Lebanese diaspora? Like, what, how could they help the Saura in winning the election? How, would, uh, how could they make them in, engaged in voting? There are. 80,000 registered voters. I have the numbers somewhere. There are, there are 80,000 who participated, I think, and there are 1 million expats. So the, the percentage of those who are abroad who participated in the election is very small. But it's not because of a, it's not because they didn't want to. as the fact that they couldn't, some of them couldn't, because the way they did the elections last time is that they had these voting booths, like you, were, you had to physically go to register and show your ID card in consulates or embassies physically. But not all cities in the world have a Lebanese embassy or a Lebanese consulate. And you're not gonna travel. Like for instance, in the United States, there is in New York, DC, LA, And if I'm not mistaken, Texas. So if you live anywhere else in the US, you're not going to vote. You're not going to take a plane just so that you can go to the embassy and give, I mean, you're going to get a hotel and you're going to pay a plane ticket. And then you're just so that you can register to vote for, you know, a schmuck. So 
so it's basically the big metropolis uh, uh, expats that voted, like Paris and London and New York and DC and and uh, I don't know, like the big African capitals and things like that. But if you live in any other type of city uh, in Africa, where, where very far from the capital, you don't vote. You know how many Lebanese expats there are in Africa? Not all of them live in major cities with embassies or consulates. So that's something that's going to have to change in the next elections if we want to encourage the diaspora to help vote. Not to mention that there's like another issue that was brought to my attention not too long ago, is that a lot of people have registered abroad, but are still in the country because they're trying to leave the country. And those guys, if they find themselves neither here nor there, will not vote. And that's a problem. So the diaspora holds the, a very important key for success, except that um, they, need, they need to be helped. Next question. So, so many people are asking if you're running for the elections next time, and I hope you are. <laughs> Thank you, that's very nice. I really appreciate the vote of confidence. I really mean it, I really appreciate it. I, I don't have an answer yet because it's, of course, it's it depends on it depends on on what's the support system, and it depends on who are the co-runners, and it depends on on the model uh, of um, the model of uh, of opposition that we are running. Mm -hmm. But um, so it depends, and I mean, so many people are trying their best to work tireless tirelessly to make a true opposition consolidated, but, you know, to be continued. And by the way, then I have to say something. Um, I am working on a project at the moment that is going to be very much, if successful, conducive to heightened representation in the elections and in the different political, um, in, the, in the political spectrum of representatives. So maybe we'll do like another session or something. We could talk about that. Great. Then. Okay, uh, we have a question. Actually, we have Walid who's raising his hand but not writing a question. And we have a question from uh, Amal, but Amal wrote a very long text and I think it's better if you ask it uh, directly. Amal, can you unmute yourself and ask your question because it's uh, a bit long and I would prefer... Yes. Hello, good evening. Uh, Randa, Hi, good evening, Sarah. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Sarah, about the coalition, uh, you didn't uh, say unity, which is very good because uh, the unity is not working, of course, uh, definitely it's not going to work. So coalition. But also I have uh, came across uh, the, the, the concept of organized anarchy. If you consider, if we consider ourselves an anarchy, but we, if we organize so it's very, it's very good for us to be a, an organized anarchy because of the possibilities of how to um, apply decision making. So there is the uh, the Cohen's decision making uh, uh, process. Uh, so we can apply it. But if we we keep uh, thinking about unity coalition, I don't know, it's good also. So if we do this uh, type of uh, if if we accept the word organized anarchy in its, in its positive uh, connotation, then we go uh, further ahead uh, mo much more quickly. Um, what do you uh, think Lara, of this? Uh, there's the garbage can model by Cohen. It says that we put, uh, because we, are, uh, uh, we have uh, different uh, likes and dislikes and we have different presence and participation, so we have organized anarchy. The way to do it is to put everything in a garbage can, everything, the problems, the solutions, the ideas, the every, in a garbage can. In a garbage can, when uh, uh, when it is time for something to be done now, it's urgent to be done now. Uh, then this is the priority. So the decision making comes across this way, not hierarchy, not whatever. So I don't know if this be uh, what you what are your thoughts on this? Thank you. Thank you, Amal. Um, just to go back to the organized anarchy, if I understood it correctly. So um, it's an interesting oxymoron, by the way, but it, if the idea is similar to organizing the mobilization, 
then that is the only way forward. Uh, if we want to call it anarchy, because I don't know if there's a specific, uh, if there's a specific story behind the choice of words. No, no, it's I, academic. In academia, you can find it. Yes, but I mean, if it's the same end result as organizing the mobilization, then then organizing the mobilization is truly the only way forward. So far, we've had mobilization, and then the mobilization decreased, and then uh, it disappeared, and then it became more like a mobilization on different webinars and different WhatsApp groups, but... Um, but it needs to start being organized and it not only organized on the webinars and on the WhatsApp groups, but it needs to be organized on the streets. As I said, we need to start talking to the people, but so that's what I think. So, uh, Sarah, what do you think of uh, the people who are a bit in the gray area? You know, they are like, they became indifferent, like, okay, uh, they became numb, if I would say, and they are just on WhatsApp groups, uh, okay, chatting, yeah, we should do something, but actually they are not taking action. And we are a bit stuck because it's as if the revolution died in a way and uh, no one is really, uh, I don't know, like motivated anymore. It's like as if they they are a bit helpless or uh, hopeless, I would uh, say. Definitely but helpless. Also, we have been expecting so much of the revolution to do everything. Like people expect the revolution to come up with a fiscal policy and a policy to what to do about Hezbollah and a policy about what to do at the garbage crisis and a policy about, we're asking the revolution to do something that the government who had the carte blanche for 30 years didn't even do 5% of. And now it's become sort of like the measuring stick for us to be like, it's not a good revolution because we don't know what they think about, uh, you know, uh, we don't know what they think about clause number 52 in that law. What is your opinion on, what is your opinion on, on, on PET plastic? Tell me now, otherwise, you know, whatever. <laughs> but, um, um, but there needs to be specific people that will, Will, will surface with faces and names and, and courage to say, this is, this, these are my answers, this is what I stand for. And we will have fellow citizens say, me too. That's the importance of the me too. Again, not in the hashtag me too campaign, but in a me too like, Anna come in. I know. I stand for that too. I believe in that too. I love what you just said. I really like that. I would like that too. Me too. But in order for the me too's to start happening, some specific people are going to have to start pronouncing themselves on difficult topics. That's part, you know, le leadership, contrary to what everyone, uh, m most people seem to believe, is the most difficult, daunting task. Some people believe leadership, like the, our politicians, is occupying a seat and being paid a salary and giving controlling commands to people. That's, that's authority, that's not leadership. People don't want authority. People are revolting against authority. People want leadership. In leadership is the whole me too thing. Is for, is for somebody to devise a certain type of idea scheme and platform for people to come and look at it and say, me too, I approve, yes. Mm, I would rather this be like that or, you know. So um, that's, yeah, it's not going to be a democracy where all of us now decide if we want Renda to be our leader, yes or no. No, at some point, Renda is going to come forth and everyone's going to be talking about Renda and Renda is going to be it. It's already starting to happen. We already have names that are circulating and things like that. The problem, the issue is, are these names going to carry that? You need to carry that and you need to walk with it. And many people, many people might not want to carry it and get there without carrying anything. If you get there without carrying anything, you're not doing the work, which is why you fail. Carry it, it's gonna be fucking heavy. Whoops, sorry, I said that word. Uh, it's just gonna be really heavy. <laughs> and then, and then, and, and then, but you're gonna get, 
if you if you do your job correctly, you're going to rewrite the nation's history. Next question. Hey, Michelle, uh, you have a hand raised uh, if you want to ask. It will be the last question for today because we are running out of really? time. There's one question that I saw. Can I ask? Uh, there's one question that I, oh, no, I think I answered it. Yeah, Michelle, you have a hand raised. I don't know if it's by mistake or you want to ask something. Last question, if anyone has uh, a last question, I think I uh, it's, may it's, have... It's uh, on purpose. Thank you so much um, for taking the question. Uh, good evening, Sara, and good evening, Randa. I just wanted to ask a question that's a bit abstract. When I think about networking right now in the revolution, especially for students, because I'm a student, I think a big part of our mobility has been a result of networking. It's been a result of communication, but it's difficult for us because it's so informal and it's so chaotic. So is it rational to expect any type of um, institutionalized change or us having, especially like as the youth, having an institutionalized role in the decision-making process or should we just expect it to keep happening? Should we just keep doing what we're doing basically? Should we just keep going down to the streets? Should we keep raising awareness? Or is there actually something that's more substantial, more formal that we can do? Um, so I think, Michelle, you might be, you might have kept more of a responsiveness than most people. It seems like you um, might have been, you might have kept your responsiveness alert, um, maybe because you are particularly, um, you, you've thought about this through and you've seen that this is extremely important for the history of our nation. And if we don't keep going, then who's gonna keep going? Which I think is a, is very wise of you. The problem is that the, responsive, your, the responsiveness is not matched by your compatriots. The type of responsiveness that you've exhibited or that you are currently exhibiting is not matched by your compatriots. And if it is not matched by the compatriots, um, there is no way forward, which goes back to the idea of the coalition that the coalition needs to be officially met in order for the mobilization to be cross strata. And then when you start putting the mobilization on people, you get responsiveness, right? Today, the responsiveness has become so minute. And if you even look at certain WhatsApp groups, it's the same names that speak, even like those that have been invited onto, and, 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 and not necessarily everyone listens to everybody. Like if there's like a thread going, people just throw in you know, what, what they think is, should be said without necessarily having a continuation. There's nothing wrong with that, but I'm just saying like, if that, like even the responsiveness there has become sort of um, um, hijacked by a little bit of, of, a, um, of chaos. So I hope that the responsiveness of Michel Ghalib will be matched by all the compatriots, and that is going to have to be drawn by leaders. If you have leaders who inspire that me too sentiment, that yes, I agree with you sentiment, you will start achieving goals. So to answer your question is, God, yes, please keep doing this. And, but we should all get others to be as responsive, if not more. And that needs to be established through contact and connection. We need to connect with our compatriots. We need to connect even with those, instead of calling out people that disagree with us or that don't think as perfectly as we do, remember the enemy of good is perfection, calling them in to try to establish what is the me too? Maybe Michelle and Sarah disagree on like, I don't know, we disagree on fiscal policy and maybe we disagree on whether we should tax the, the rich or the middle class or the poor, but we don't disagree on gay rights and we don't disagree on uh, women's rights and we don't disagree on environmental protection. Just to establish at least some form of connection of what we all stand for, not just stand against, right? Like if we stand against, uh, that's, that's not good. It's not enough what we stand for. And then we can start sort of mobilizing this responsiveness for true nation building. 
So yes, please keep doing that. And if you find someone to associate with on certain points, associate with them and associate with me and associate with Randa. And I hope we will, uh, I really, really hope we will, it will be contagious enough for us to overthrow the regime. So that's, that's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're having a great feedback on the session. Plenty of people are uh, sending us how much they loved it. We will take the last question by Karam. Uh, so Karam is asking that the revolutions of Latin America were of Christian background, the ones you mentioned today. So they had a similar theme to drive change through religion that sparks emotion for change. How do you do that with various religious sects in a country like Lebanon? So actually the whole Marxist uh, nationalistic stamp of the Latin American revolutions were starting to, starting to move away from from religion um now latin america is a deeply mostly catholic culture right but the revolutions per se did not use any catholic symbol symbolism or did not use any catholic um uh speech in order to incur any type of mobilization they were relying on deeply marxist and nationalistic ideals which, as I said, failed for uh, nine out of the 11 and only worked for two of, of the 11. So, so that's for the Latin American. In, in Lebanon, and let me see, if, I need to take this opportunity to really give a good answer on, 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 the, on the religious question. I think the, dispar the disparity and the the several the several religions that reside in Lebanon and the historic reason for why that is so, the fact that we were a refuge um, for so many different confessions. When I say we, I mean Lebanon. I don't mean you know uh, that we as as Lebanon were a refuge for so many different confessions that we offered um, that we offered such plurality and diversity for people to come here and find themselves regardless of what was going to be told to them. Now, of course, we, we, we went through so many different pockets of um, like the Ottoman Empire wasn't exactly a liberal empire. And, uh, and then when the French mandate came through, they didn't necessarily come through to establish secularism, but they were um, just trying to organize the mess that uh, there is a very funny story. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm just going to paraphrase it. But when they were drawing, when they were doing a census, the French in the 20s, when they were doing a census of the different religions, and they had so many different Christian confessions, right? But like minorities, real minorities, right? Like, like Orthodox this, Catholic this, then the same, and then it's like a progressive Catholic this, progressive Orthodox this, and then uh, they had so many. The, the very famous sentence is, foutez-moi tout ça dans Maronite. Donc, put all of this under Maronite. Foutez-moi tout ça dans Maronite. So even the French thought that it was slightly uh, uh, too chaotic for them, for their organizational skills to have so many different confessions. So they're just like, let's just delete them and put them under Maronite, right? Um, but that, this, that didn't necessarily uh, cause any strife, right? It just, it is what it is. So I guess what I'm trying to say is our diversity and, and our cultural uh, openness is our saving grace. It really is. And I know we have a lot of confessionalism. And I know there's a lot of sectarianism, but that is due to politicking because it's deeply political. Nobody that has faith in a very faith oriented type of manner is confessional. I really believe that people who are sectarian and confessional by identity are politically confessional and not faith based. Faith based identity is actually very open, very blessing oriented, very blessed. And they are beautiful in the way they express themselves. Anyone who's confessional and anyone who's mutasib is politically mutasib. 
ما عم بحكي politically as an أحزاب عم بحكي politically as in it's not faith based it's politics based and that is going to be resolved with politics it's not going to be resolved with faith that is my uh, long answer <laughs> Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for this very interesting session. Thank you all for attending uh, this session with I Have Learned Academy. And we thank a lot uh, the support of CAS, Conrad Adenauer Stiftung, for this uh, amazing uh, opportunity to offer education related to economics, politics, finance to the audience. So I would uh, like to remind you to stay tuned on our website, www.ihavelearned.me slash events to check our upcoming sessions. We're gonna have uh, two free sessions per month um, about very interesting topics. I'm sure Sarah, you will see her again in <laughs> next year, 2021, very soon. Yes. Uh, and more sessions. Really? And, uh, if I haven't, if I haven't answered um, somebody's question or anything, please reach out to me, send me a message on Instagram. I, I'm, I usually try to be good and try to answer as many as I can. And I think I'm a nice person, so you can say most things to me. <laughs> but um, and anyway, so, in, in any case, you can also email us on info at I have learned dot me, uh, and we can transfer your question for any. Uh, exactly. Person. You 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 can also email Randa, who's also a very nice person. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for attending, and thank you, Sarah. See you all very soon. I will send you an email also with an evaluation form and just. Uh, uh, a link also for the YouTube uh, link if you want to watch again the session or share it with your friends. Thank you so much and see you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.